Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining this session. Today, actually, I will uh, not play the role of a security expert, but I will be an attacker. I will share with you the experience that we gathered together with my team that is also here attending the talk. Uh, while we wanted to reach a clear objective, we wanted to penetrate and to stay hidden into a building automation network. This was the goal that drove our actions. And as every project, when it first starts, you need to define your requirements. So we had some must-have of our attack. We wanted to be persistent, but differently from what generally is done, we wanted to be persistent at level one, on the device, on the controller. We also wanted to be undetectable. And to do that, we actually had to clean our footprints every time we were doing a malicious action. At the same time, we wanted to be stealthy, so we wanted that the security solution, if they were deployed in the network, they would have not be able to detect us. And for this, we needed zero days. Together with my staff, we also had some nice to have, some characteristics we hope we could put into our attack. For instance, we wanted to be modular so that we could adapt to different topology of the network. We also wanted to be reusable. As a puzzle, we wanted that the different pieces of the attack we were going to create could be reused partially, plug and played, in order to, for instance, have a different target. And at the same time, last but not least, we wanted to be reasonably cheap. When we started with this project, I got approved by the management, but I didn't get millions. I get like a moderate budget. So we don't want to invest as much. First thing, and, and I want to give you some assumptions. So we are security experts. We are definitely not cyber attackers. We don't do that as a job. But at the same time, we need to understand how an attacker thinks like if you want to create security solutions that are able to, to defeat them. There are different strategies that try to model how attacks are created and how they are executed. I'm fairly sure everybody in this audience knows about the cyber kill chain, which has been recently adapted to be the ICS cyber kill chain, which basically has different steps and models and stages. Also, Mandiant did um, a cyber attack life cycle. Uh, these models, they share a lot, uh, and we took the last one as, as a reference model because it's a bit simpler, it doesn't have as many steps as the ICS cyber kill chain, for instance. So how the process that we executed looks like? Well, first of all, uh, a bit of background information. So security matters, and we, uh, me as a CTO, we are experts as, uh, um, in industrial control system security and operation. And when we started to look at building automation system, we thought the similarities with ICS would be a lot. Actually, we discovered there are not so many. Uh, and so what I'm going to describe to you today is the whole process, the whole learning process. We started this project like 18 months ago. And the first thing we had to do as attackers also is reconnaissance. So what are the information out there? How a building automation network looks like? What are the technologies that are already exploits there? How can we find access means? So once we do reckon, we moved to the research phase. Here, this was already getting a bit more hands-on. We wanted to see if there were exploits existing already, if there are zero days, how easy it is to find zero days for building automation. And then, as any attacker, you go into the weaponize. So you gathered enough information, you are confident enough that you can plan the attack and you can develop it. At this point, you have to launch, to compromise your network. And uh, in this phase, you need to move laterally, for instance, to, to follow your plan and to finally execute it. And at the end, we wanted to be persistent. We wanted to persist after reboots, be sure that if something changes on the device, the malware will still be there, and we will be uh, cleaning our traces. In the following of the presentation, for each of these phases, 
I will share with you what we have learned, how we have executed the phases, and, um, and I will provide you some technical details of what came out. So first phase, recon. How our target networks looks like. This morning they were speaking about the purdue level, how ICS network looks like, what if we go into a physical building. First of all, we should think that building automation system is not home automation. So they are two different things. When we speak about physical building in this case, it's not the residential home, but we are really speaking about hospitals, airport, we are speaking about uh, um, offices, banks, data centers. Well, typically, they have a variety of systems, and this system, for instance, include the surveillance system, IP cameras. They also include lifts, air conditioning. I hope I could hack the air conditioning this morning because it was so cold. <laughs> <laughs> and those systems are actually connected, and there is a layer which is a management layer. This management layer has different software, for instance, an NVR, which is a network video recorder, or a BMS, a building management system. These systems, what they do, they basically are the equivalent of a SCADA or a DCS. Uh, they control the physical system, so they control the HVAC, they control the, the badge, who has access to what restricted area, the lift, the operation, um, the difference is that those subsystems on the opposite of ICS, they are quite cross vendors. So you can have a BMS that is actually controlling and monitoring systems from different vendors. You can have the lift that is from vendor A and the badge which is from vendor B. And at the end then you have the, the control, the layer one, the controllers with the layer one devices which are typically mm, called building controllers and they do the different functionalities. So opening the door if the badge is the correct one and setting the temperature. Actually, these buildings are also connected to the internet for a variety of reasons. One of the main reasons is for remote control and maintenance. As we were saying, there are a lot of different systems from different vendors. So the system integrators or who is in charge of the building control actually wants to have remote access and that is given because the facility manager or the facility owner it doesn't know what the, their building automation system looks like so it's it's um, very common to have this kind of connection to the internet where as we know there is a variety of threats so what did we find at the beginning well, we found, as you might be expecting, that there are a lot of devices that actually are internet facing. This device might be the camera. This might be not surprising after Mirai. But here we are not speaking of the cameras that you buy at the Best Buy. We are speaking of cameras that cost like five, 600 euros each, which are deployed as industrial cameras. And you also have thermostats or even controllers directly exposed. We also understood that these networks are not segmented. You might think otherwise, but we have been validating this topology, this architecture, with many customers after we gather this information. And what happens most is that you have VLANs, but you definitely do not have a properly segmented network. What does that mean? That it's not rare that your IP camera is actually in the same network where your lift and your access control system is. And, as in ICS, all those systems are not really patched. Uh, there is lack of visibility, and actually what I thought is like it's a, uh, a key finding. It's quite strange because the building automation system is where IT and OT convergence is happening. You see a lot of IT elements entering in old legacy OT systems. It's true that these are smart buildings, and we are calling them smart buildings, but actually they rely on legacy systems. Uh, I think it's estimated that 60% of the buildings we are in today, they are relying on technology 20 years old. So this is the sort of landscape. We gathered that. We did a couple of months of research. And what we did, we did we do next? Well, we will move to the research phase. And here, our objective was, okay, now we know we have a model. It's validated. It's how things look like in reality. How can 
enter this network and how can we persist? How can we clear the footprints? How can we avoid detection? Let's look at zero days. Can we actually develop a malware which is targeted to building automation networks? That is like what Stuxnet did for ICS. And can we do that considering that the building automation system is not 100% OT nor 100% IT? And there are also different platforms. I don't know if you had, but QNX is quite adopted in building automation. It's a different operative system. It's a different platform. So what we did next was to build our lab. So we took controllers from top vendors, uh, not only controllers, but full systems. So we have a fully working state-of-the-art badge system for opening doors if you are allowed to. And uh, these controllers are specific for building automation, so access control, HVAC, lighting, escalators, elevators. And also about the firmware. Well, it, it was not easy to build this uh, lab because, as I mentioned before, you don't go to the Best Buy to buy this hardware. You need specific channels, specific distributors. So it took quite some time. But at the end, we managed to build it. this lab is something that uh, we are working on for quite some time, and we can do some of our experiments. We are working on making it look a little bit better. So then we hired some of the students, like Clement that is here, and we asked them, guys, can you play with this lab and tell us what you can find in terms of vulnerabilities? Well, they took some time, and a couple of months during a summer internship, they actually found 10 zero days ranging from 10, 15 different devices uh, was the analysis based on. And as you see, there are different kinds of zero days, vulnerabilities, misconfiguration, cool as you call them as you prefer. And this one includes, for instance, uh, cross-site scripting, a path traversal, arbitrary file detection, but especially one important one was a buffer overflow. This was important because it was critical, it was important because we say, wow, we can exploit it and maybe getting the control, the full control on the controller. And because indeed it was on a controller, widely used, widely adopted, and used for us as control and for batch. We thought that at this point we were ready to actually move on and we, yeah, we could actually build the malware we had in our mind. So let's go back to our network. What is the plan? We thought, all right, we will gain access from the IP cameras. And I didn't mention that before, but uh, while we wanted to do our analysis, we also bought three IP cameras from the top vendors. And then in July, I believe, uh, the Vidu report came out. Vidu did a report about a certain IP camera, and they found five, I think, very strong vulnerabilities with exploits. Then we said, OK, fine, they, they, they helped us. We will use one of their exploits. But then from the camera, we will move laterally to one of the workstations that was in our lab that also had some vulnerability that we could exploit. We would delete, delete all the logs and traces that we were on the camera so that if some forensics activity would come, we would not find anything. And then we would have done the second lateral movement to actually arrive to the device. You might ask why. Why do you want to do that? Well, because, for instance, in some intrusion detection systems or security solutions, it's not common that a camera talks to a controller, to a device controller, so that might raise an alert. It, but it's normal that a camera might speak with an RVR, which is on a Windows workstation machine. So to this degree, to be more stealthy, we did several lateral movements. Once we are on the controller, we can actually execute our payload, and I'll tell you a bit more details about that, cleaning again the traces on the workstations, and finally persist at level one. So once we are there, we are there to stay. Finally, we had the plan, we developed something, and we executed this malware that we developed, and I would provide some of the details of each and every step. So gain access. We are assuming the camera is on the internet and that actually someone can enter it. 
How did we do that? As I mentioned, yeah, there were three vulnerabilities that were uh, recently disclosed, and the exploit was also recently discovered. And what we did, we reused this exploit, we implemented it, it works, and we enter through a camera. And we also use some simple commands to actually remove the locks that are on the camera. Once in, and later on I can discuss that the way you can enter, this is just a simple example, but there are many. Once in, what you can do? Well, you can move laterally and arrive to your Windows workstation. In this case, this was yeah, when we contacted the vendors, there is always like a difficulty in understanding whether it's a zero days, whether it's a, a misconfiguration. In this case, it was a misconfiguration introduced somehow with default credentials that allowed us to enter in the windows and also to basically uh, enable some characteristic of MS SQL that could allow us to upload file on the windows uh, station. Also here, once you are there, uh, because of the, of the vulnerabilities that we have found, you can actually also remove the logs of your presence. And then we went for the most core part, the most new part of this attack, which is the movement from the workstation to the access control PLC. One thing um, about these building controllers that they all share, most of them, they actually rely on web technologies. Uh, in this specific case, the framework, you have a, a, a QNX operative system, and QNX has a function, it's called QCon, which is a mix between Telnet and FTP that can basically manage to allow you to upload some files. On top of the operative system, the vendor has the framework with a daemon that is vulnerable to buffer overflows. And on top of that, you have the web, the web application. So what the web application does basically you have a badge, and you allow this badge, which is associated to a person, to enter or not certain restricted areas. Now, our exploitation basically started by exploiting the buffer overflow that we found. And from there, we managed to create, actually Clement managed to create um, a payload that could launch QCon. And once this was launched, we could actually enable the upload function, and then finally upload our malware and execute it. Once we are, what, the, what did we do as a malware? So we got a badge. Imagine that in your other room tonight, you just forget during the checkout to leave your badge, and you bring it with you. You just need one badge of that system. And then what you can do is basically launch the attack, and that badge that before was denied certain access now we will be able to do it. Actually, indeed, the malware, the final piece of the malware, it just contains some HTTP request, post request, to change at will the capabilities of the badge, the grant, the permissions of the badge. And also here on the malware, on the device itself, we could actually delete the logs of our presence to make forensics activities more difficult. Good, we are on the device. What should we do now? Well, we should persist. We want to be there to stay, and we want that if someone logs in or a reboot of the system happens, uh, we can stay there as long as possible. The first thing to do when we wanted to, to persist at this level is, OK, let's look at the literature, how persistence is done. If you look at the MITRE uh, attack model, there are these techniques mostly, mostly um, used for, uh, for persistence, which is basically using a job. So for instance, uh, the cron job in such a way that every minute, hour, day, month, your malware to add um, grant permission to your badge is activated. You can actually also modify your boot script in such a way that when a boot something happens, your malware is executed first and then the whole framework gets um, started. You can also change some configuration file for a shell, the PSAJR C file, and in this way what you can do 
is basically be sure that when this shell is called before the shell, you are actually calling the malware. And finally, another common technique is what is commonly known as path interception. There are different varieties of this. And uh, basically here, what you can do is changing the global variable path in such a way that your malware always is called before the daemon or the starting part of, of, the, um, of the framework. Right, this is the theory. That's what happens in practice. Actually, we learned a lot of things. We learned, for instance, that especially on QNX, cron is not an applicable technique. It just doesn't exist, it's not there, and installing it, it would be quite intrusive. And one of the lessons learned was also that uh, changing a boot script, in this case, uh, was not easy. We did, and then we discovered that uh, the memory is a read-only memory where the boot script is. So the controller just became a brick. We had to send it back in assistance, explain that it just strangely stopped working. <laughs> we got it back after a couple of weeks. And then, meanwhile, we knew that we were not going to apply the changing of the configuration file for the shell because this was not stealth enough. Uh, that meant that you needed to log in in order to launch the shell and to launch your malware. So you didn't have really enough control. So that also was out of the picture. And uh, we could actually de do path interception. This one, Eureka, was the one working because when we managed to change the global path variable in such a way that our malware was called first and then the framework, it was a proof of concept working and we had our persistence there. So concluding, I didn't spend too much time on the technical details for a variety of reasons. Some of our ethical reasons, we are not sure we want to share uh, the whole code. We are still considering it. But another reason is because a report, a full report is coming out where you can actually um, get hands on, on, on the techni technicalities. What I wanted to share with you was the, the whole picture, the whole journey that we did. And part of the journey is the cost part. So I mentioned before that we didn't have much budget. So this is a breakdown of the cost that we went under to, to build this attack, this targeted attack to building automation networks. And in total, actually, we spent around $11,000. And the message here is this is not state-sponsored. It's quite a good return of investment from an attacker. Because what if you are doing a ransomware and asking for, you are blocking the access control to a hospital or to an airport, and you ask for a ransom? You can have quite a good business case here. And also, as I mentioned, we wanted to do an attack that is modular. And there can be quite some variations. So what we did today was just slowly altering the controller uh, of an access, physical access control, we added more grant, grant the, sorry, more permissions to a user. You can actually also delete users. What if a doctor cannot enter an emergency room anymore? Or you are switching off data centers and the system uh, operator cannot go there. So it will be actually quite, change, quite easy to change the target of the malware. You can enter from many different Paths. The IP camera was an easy example, the first one that we could reuse. But what if an IoT device that we just plug it in, like a thermostat, a casino, was just hacked like that? Uh, what if you are handling from a Wi-Fi router or so from other systems that are exposed? And also the objectives could be different. You could change the temperature in HVAC. And there is the misconception that HVAC is only about, OK, being a bit chill or a bit warm in a hotel room. HVAC are actually controlling data centers with the critical information. They are also controlling hospitals, mines where people is working, or tunnels where tons of cars are passing by. So it's more critical than, than we think. And I would like you to answer this question, actually. Is this threat real? So we notified we did disclosure, responsible disclosure for all of the devices, and there is a patch for all of these vulnerabilities. Some of the patch actually were already been released, but never communicated 
to the public. So for the built-in controller, for the cameras that we used in this attack, we went on Shodan and on Census, the new engine that is doing a similar job, to see how many of those devices were having the same model were on the internet. So for the building controller, we had almost 23,000 controllers with the same model that is vulnerable facing the internet. For the cameras, we had 11,000. And then we saw, we did a different query, how many of them are still vulnerable? And we have 40% of those building controllers and 91% of those cameras are still vulnerable. Which means that our attack could be launched to 40% of these controllers just work without not even being needed to infiltrate. So what are my key takeaways for this talk? Well, first of all, I really wanted to share like, the journey and the lesson, many lessons learned that we had. 30 minutes are not enough, so I would be happy if we can speak afterward. But especially there are these messages. It's quite easy to attack a building automation network. We were not cyber attackers by, by job, but we managed to. It's quite cheap. It's not state-sponsored. Attacks can be here to stay. They can persist, and they can persist long. And they're actually quite difficult to detect. The reason why we do this research is also to improve silent defense in such a way that our solution could be able to face these kind of attacks. And if you do not have any security solution, especially if you are not if your solution is not thinking of building automation system, which are different from industrial control system, then um, you have uh, a security posture that is not state of the art. And thank you for this. I hope I brought you some interesting information. Yeah, thank you very much, Elisa. Is there anybody with a question here? Please uh, state your name and company before the question. Aaron Leverett, the University of Cambridge. I'm just curious why you chose the persistence on the PLC uh, as opposed to something else, and would there be differences or advantages to persisting on different parts of the network from your point of view? Yeah, thank you. We thought that on the level one, the persistence would be more difficult to find from forensic analysts. So a forensic analyst will start going on the Windows machines, and uh, the, it's a QNX also in this case, or like the operating system is different. So I think expert is, it would be just much more stealthier if we were doing that there, and it would be also different from what has been typically done, so you didn't have to just copy-paste some of the existing techniques. My name is Arne Dietrich, I'm with Stanford University, and I'm just curious if you also have the time to look at one of the more uh, um, state-of-the-art state building controllers, the JASIS, as they're standardized by Tritium. Some of the state-of-the-art? Building, building control systems like the JASIS, the Java controlled. We are not going to release names for the, the controllers that we used in, the, um, in this experiment. We have looked at top vendors, and this is not a war against the vendors. Like Everybody has their own uh, vulnerabilities. It's just like an awareness for the community. So what we want to share is like, yeah, everybody can be vulnerable. We have to work together with this. What I can tell you, which is an interesting story, is that actually this controller, which was um, bought now, was 2018, right? And it, we used it as it was coming. We didn't double check, but actually it was already coming and shipped with a version that was two years older. And that's why it was vulnerable also. So that they says a lot about the awareness. Hi, Dan Schaefer, Phoenix Contact. Outside of, of closing some of the obvious vulnerabilities and, and patching, what sort of defensive recommendations could have been done to foil your attacks? Well, you could... Of, I mean, if you have like a really, like in, we, we tested it with silent defense, for instance, and there were some traces on the network. So although we, can't, we deleted the traces that are on the controller itself, 
if the controller, sorry, if the malware wants to move, it needs to leave some traces on the network. So, for instance, there is some indicator of compromise, like the fact uh, that, uh, um, like the, the, the workstation was not exactly the workstation used to configure uh, that controller. So, you would have seen a path there, a single communication that might uh, alert something. So, let's say it's sm much more stealthier from a device perspective, but from a network, there is some traces that you can be alerted from. Yeah, if you know what you are looking for. Hi. Uh, 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 hi, my name is Daniel. I work for Dragos, and I was wondering from your perspective what the strategy is for the attacker um, for moving from um, any impact to a specific impact and how an attacker would would, would navigate the system and understand the system to have a specific in impact on that. Yeah. Well, one word, BACnet. I mean, the BACnet protocol is saying so much about the whole network that if during your recon you actually listen to that, or if you understand the, the, the vendor-specific protocols for BD automation, you can gather a lot of information what is critical. There is, uh, and this is one actually clear difference with ICS. The protocol used for building automation systems, they are so friendly, they tell you so many things that you can use as an attacker to actually target it much better.